I was talking to this guy the other day, man, and a very powerful uh, person. And Ken, he said that his church literally had a meeting to avoid talking about sin, judgment, holiness, the wrath of God, the reality of an eternal hell. And uh, they they literally got their little tinker pot, you know, elder board and their little pastors or whatever the heck these hirelings are calling themselves now. And they talked about how they could dance around all those incredible issues. And uh, brother, that's some, that's some scary CRAP to me. I would not, I would leave if I was an elder, I'd resign right there. If I was part, if I was an associate pastor and those words came out of that dipstick lead pastor's mouth, I would like, I'm out. Welcome to another episode of Encounters with God. I have a special guest today that's on the show, uh, Doug Giles. Doug is a pastor. He's an author. He's an artist, husband, father. He's got a couple of daughters. And I'm um, just excited to speak to Doug about his new book uh, about the life of John the Baptist. So, uh, Doug, uh, thanks for coming on the program today. Thanks for having me, Ken. How you doing, big dog? I am doing great. Doing great. We'll put this in the show notes, but this is Doug's uh, new book here, John the Baptist. Um, a Rude Awakening Precedes a Great Awakening. So what brought about this book, Doug? Yeah, I mean, obviously the church... Uh, needs God's help real bad. And uh, our culture, you know, it sucks worse than an airplane toilet. And then you've got the cultural Marxist zombie, you know, sitting behind that august uh, resolute desk where Bill Boinked Monica, who is completely gutting our entire nation, Ken. So we're in desperate need of God. And uh, we're seeing stuff, you know, like in Asbury and at Baylor University. And people are like, this is a revival. This is an awakening. And uh, so I started uh, studying uh, revivals a long, long time ago, stuff that happened in Western Europe and Southern Europe, and also the Chinese church and how it's growing under, you know, incredible persecution. And so with, with all the awakenings that happen here in the United States as well, uh, I don't think we should throw around the term revival and awakening uh, <laughs> too loosely, you know, just because a bunch, and again, I'm all for it, man. If a bunch of high school kids want to get together and instead of smoke fentanyl or crystal meth and worship God for, you know, four to six hours, knock yourself out, man. But in regards to a true, you know, Holy Spirit inspired, sovereign, providential act of God, uh, I don't think that's it. I think it's a, I'm not trying to discourage it. But when you look at awakenings, you got to go back to the greatest awakening ever. And that's the the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ. And uh, so so when when he came on the scene, whoo, man, he definitely uh, woke people up. He transformed, you know, this planet. Still been doing it by his spirit for the last two thousand years. But one thing that I noticed, uh, Ken, and I, I'm sure your audience is thinking, uh, "Duh, Captain Obvious," was that there's this weird little critter that was inextricably spot welded uh, to the ministry, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that's John the Baptist. And uh, I'm sure, you know, one of your viewers right now is like, and well, and this, this guy was an obtuse character with a terse message of turn or burn. He pointed out sin in the congregation that was coming to him. He lambasted all the major Christian influencers on Instagram. If you're a politician and uh, you're full of more crap than a colicky baby's diaper, then he's going to let you have it right in front of everybody. And he was an equal opportunity offender. His message, uh, again, was repentance, do a 180, uh, turn or burn. And, uh, and this is the thing that, you know, the, the subtitle of the book points out. It's like, if you really want Jesus in your life, if you want Jesus in your family, if you want Jesus in your church, uh, state, or culture, then you, need, then you need to brace yourself for the message of repentance. You need to brace yourself uh, for a rude awakening, because Jesus is not just going to float into your trailer house just because uh, you want him to give you an upgrade and be living your best life now. He wants somebody who's broken. He wants somebody who's repentant. He wants somebody who's shedding off their body of death. He wants somebody like Isaiah who says, woe is me, I'm ruined. And Ken, I don't, I don't hear any of that stuff going around much anymore. It's always, it's all, you've got a great purpose. 
you're living below your potential. Uh, you know what? When when uh, when Christ met Paul, and when any of the Old Testament prophets uh, had a toe to toe with God in a theophany or even a, an angel, they felt like dead men. And uh, I'm looking for the the awakening. I'm looking for the revival, Ken that has the, you know, no filter repentance message where people just break and they come to Christ wholeheartedly and they're not looking for a Cadillac or a condo down in Fort Lauderdale. They're not looking for a, a girlfriend that looks like, you know, Heidi Klum and has the heart of Mother Teresa. They just want God and they're just shattered. And uh, that's what John the Baptist did. He shattered rocks. He pulled up stumps. And he preached a message, again, that most pastoral search committees would not allow a pastor to preach on their stage. He wouldn't get invited to conferences. But God says, you know what? That weird critter right there, he is spot well to my son. And um, and I again, you know, going back to why I wrote it, I think if we're going to see a move of God, then, man, we need some truth dealers. We need plain spoken pastors and not woke, politically correct wussies. So that's my whole point behind it. I love it. Uh, yeah, I got the book, and uh, it just really stirred my spirit, Doug. I read it in uh, one sitting, and I also bought the audio book. I love the, uh, for people out there, you'll want to you wanna buy both, uh, get the audio book, so you can hear uh, Doug's uh, tone of voice uh, throughout the, the book. But in the first chapter, Doug, you... Uh, you talk about uh, the uh, puppets in the pulpit, different uh, types of uh, puppets that we have in today's modern day church, uh, the evangelical enterprise. Uh, tell us uh, some of those puppets that you see uh, passing off as prophets these days. Yeah, so uh, there's various types of puppets, as your audience knows. There's finger puppets, uh, there's uh, sock puppets, there's pole puppets, there's the uh, complicated marionette, there's the ventriloquist dummy, uh, which Jeff uh, Dunham is brilliant, you know, with his his uh, his dummies and stuff. I was watching him the other day, Ken, and uh, I laughed so hard, milk came out of my nostrils, and I haven't had milk since 1986. <laughs> I love it. So, so, um, so when I was talking to Alan West uh, on his show uh, yesterday, Steadfast and Loyal, and um, we were just, you know, both of us just up to here, man, with uh, modern day ministers and stuff. I think I think that the majority of pastors, you know, especially the the successful influencers that are all the cat's pajamas on Instagram and stuff. Hmm. Uh, I wonder uh, if I wonder if a lot of them have this thing called uh, holy dread on their life in regards to their calling, because you look at guys like Ezekiel. He wasn't some puppet of some professional prophetic school. You know, he didn't he didn't come, you know, <laughs> out of a laboratory at some Bible college that's trying to create some kind of hip and groovy, you know, Jesus that would be uh, palatable for the persnickety postmodern uh, person's taste. He God, God told Ezekiel, he said, I want you to eat the scroll. Uh, I want you to understand that I'm going to make your forehead as hard as Israel's uh, apostate forehead is. He said, in addition, I want you to uh, uh, really understand, Ezekiel, that if you don't say what I say, when I say to say it, and something bad smacks this land, that I'm going to hold you accountable. Uh, I'm going to put their blood on your head. Tell me how many pastors have that kind of call on their life. I heard this guy say a few years back, Ken, he's like, he goes, you know what? He said, I was thinking about, you know, possibly going into the ministry because it's a powerful position and everybody, you know, respects and loves. And, and I was like, oh, my God, dude, you you are standing in line to become a spiritual prostitute. You are you are dosi doing up to the line to be struck by lightning. This is something to be run from. If you're if you're getting into the the. <laughs> If you're thinking about getting into the pastorate for money and for power and for accolades, you need to you need to drop what you're doing right now and flee, flee yeah. the opposite direction, because the the minister is going to go under stricter judgment than the the normal Christian, according to the Book of James. Ergo, uh, 
I can't see how people will pu- will parrot uh, Ken. It's like, hey, what's the left saying? Okay, we'll take some of that on. And now all of a sudden, what's the critical race theorist saying? All right, we'll embrace that. And what's the Black Lives Mafia uh, telling you know people to do and how we should bow and kiss their ring and their backside? And then you see massive amounts of church, Ken, that adopt this stuff. we got a church in Austin, powerful, hip, groovy church, growing like a weed. And uh, the, the white pastor apologized for being a racist and apologized for the color of his skin publicly to his church. And he hadn't done anything. He's never donned black face. He never put on a Ku Klux Klan hood and lynched black people you know, outside of uh, Mississippi or any of that stuff. He just vied in to what they wanted him to parrot. Yeah. And there you go. He's just chirp, chirp, chirping along what uh, this culture wants him to say. Uh, John the Baptist didn't play that game, man. Christ didn't play that game. They were heat seeking truth missiles. And if uh, and if, if it went, if it wasn't something that the father was saying, if it was not ensconced by the prophets and in the law, they're not going to say it. And uh, and they didn't give two flippity gibbets who had a problem with that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think uh, you see the contrast of the ministers that uh, are coming out of the seminary uh, today and you see how God molded men in the wilderness quite the contrast where these men were men of God, you know, it, like you said, it was a holy dread. It was like, woe is me if I preach not this message from God, you know, they weren't out there when the Pharisees and Sadducees after JB's ministry started taking up, they weren't, JB wasn't saying, oh, wow, you know, let's shoot a selfie here. And, uh, you know, I can post this on my social media accounts. And it seems like today, these a lot of these pastors, uh, if you can call them that, uh, they've turned into now, I guess the new word is, Doug, is, is it life coach? Yeah. Yeah. Influencers. And uh, again, Ken, you know, and I, I feel I'm comedic. I feel I'm lighthearted. This is not anything to play around with. When yeah. So I was out of the ministry for about 10 years and had a very powerful uh, news portal, uh, ClashDaily.com. Uh, we had 2 million followers on Facebook. We had a page reach of 10 to 20 million people a week, not a month or a year. Mm-hmm. We're one of the top publishers on Facebook. Uh, we made a ton of money uh, at the new site until Air Zuckerberg uh, banned me. And so I've got different streams of income and in uh, and a few businesses. And I'm sitting here after Clash Daily uh, was attacked uh, by uh, Satan's little five foot, four inch, weird looking henchman, uh, Zuckerberg. And I'm sitting here and, you know, it's like, okay, God, I kind of saw this coming, but I really didn't see it coming. Now I'm here getting old, you know, what do you want me to do? And uh, I thought I was done with ministry, Ken. I was going to ride that news portal into the sunset. It was great money, very powerful, uh, fun and, uh, biblically based, uh, reporting and stuff on steroids and i'm sitting here you know at the at the 57 year mark at that time and he said feed my sheep and i was like i rebuke you satan he said no feed my sheep it's like this is the devil because i was done with i was done especially church stuff like Mm -hmm. like i i love preaching i love god uh i hate church i hate it you know not the people but the churchy stuff you know it's like well, did, did you drink a beer today? It's like, so what if I did? You're 400 pounds overweight, you know? Mm. <laughs> I got a cigar company, man, and people freak out that uh, I enjoy a cigar and I have a cigar company. And I was like, well, let me ask you a question. If um, if you were going to write best-selling books that were to last, you know, for eons and eons, what would you do for inspiration? Would you take a sabbatical? Yeah. Would you fast? Yes. Would you, uh, you know, read the great, you know, writers and try to pick up on their vibe and how they created something that was timeless? Absolutely. Uh, would you have people lay hands on you? You bet. And uh, I said, would you drink uh, pints of beer at 11 o'clock at a pub and smoke cigars with a bunch of atheists? And I was preaching that in London and they looked at me like a calf looks at the owner when uh, you change uh, the gate, you know, and um, I said, 
and the, the audience just felt dead quiet. And I said, well, if you wouldn't, and if you think that's evil, then you would erase from uh, the arsenal of the most incredible Christian literature uh, written at least in the 20th century, because that's what C.S. Lewis did. Hmm. Yeah. So anyway, um, back to the the uh, the feed my sheep refrain that I kept hearing by the Holy Spirit. I couldn't shake it. And then then I embraced it and I started a monthly uh, meeting called Cigars and Sermons outside of Austin, like 25 clicks. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that exploded. And we started, you know, meeting uh, weekly and then we turned it into Liberty Fellowship. But here's my whole rambling point in that circuitous uh, <laughs> uh, weird story is that when 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 I got back in to this role and God brought me back here, I look at it completely different. Uh, than I did when I was uh, a late 20 something. This, sure. is, this is serious business. This is not a game. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and what the church is going through right now and what our culture and what's happening to our family and our Southern border and our nation's economy and what Biden, uh, again, the half dead Marxist carrier pigeon for all of Obama's third term desires is doing to our nation is atrocious. We've got China and Russia in Iran and South and North Korea, that I guarantee that they're chomping at the bit uh, to wound us deeply. Mm-hmm. And so for, for a pastor to get up there in these kind of days of declension, this is not a freaking game. And if you don't deal with the most salient issues that are going down right here and right now and address it publicly, powerfully, biblically, uh, 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 then, then you've got this incredible bad accountability that you're going to have to reckon with when you take the big dirt nap. So that's always in the front of everything that I write, everything that I do that I'm, I'm 60 now, man. And the plane is landing, Ken. And uh, I might live to be 120, but uh, the days are numbered. And uh, I know that. And so I don't want to have an embarrassing uh, chat with the Lord Jesus Christ. When, uh, when I expire, I want him to say, well done. I, I want him to say, listen, you weren't ashamed of my words in this perverted and adulterous generation. Come on in. Here's a here's an all-access laminate. Uh, John the Baptist over there and also Peter and Paul. You know, go chat with them. I don't want to be in the nosebleed seats, Ken, where all the chicken pastors are going to sit if they even get in. After denying Christ and his word in front of, you know, the fearful uh, culture. Yeah. You know, the red letters, they're always important, aren't they, Doug? Uh, you know, Jesus said from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent force and the violent men take it by force. Now, that's just something that you don't hear with these uh, ministries nowadays, is it? Yeah, that's, uh, first of all, that's my life verse. But uh, like you said, that's probably the most ignored verse in, 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 in uh, Christendom. If uh, people think that uh, I'm full of specious, do go to your uh, go to your uh, church's YouTube page or sermon archives and type in Matthew eleven twelve and then hit you know search and see if there <laughs> if there's even a scant message of that verse. But like you said, there it is, boom, red letters. Jesus said it, and he said it about John. And uh, I like the whole the whole context of, of John coming online to me again. It's just fascinating. Is you got prophetic silence for 400 years. Yeah. God's not saying squat after uh, the book of Malachi. But Malachi said the son of righteousness is coming. And before he comes, uh, he's going to be uh, uh, he's going to be preceded by Elijah, if you will. And so so you got 400 years. God's not speaking. Religion's flourishing. But God's not saying squat, which I find interesting. Yeah. You know, God's not talking and woo. Religious business is good. And then all of a sudden, uh, here comes, you know, weird, creepy John. He shows up out of nowhere. He's, uh, he's eating bugs. He's, he's wearing a homemade fur coat, just like typical redneck. And uh, no one knows who he is. He hasn't done a miracle. He hasn't written a book. And um, he just starts preaching a scathing message of repentance. And Jesus said, when John showed up, he said, pretty much all hell broke loose. Yeah. Kingdom violence, you know, started occurring. And he said, if you're going to get in the kingdom, 
I think about this, man. He said, if you're going to, he said, from the days of John the Baptist unto this present day, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. And everybody's like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> Ever since John opened his mouth, all of hell came online. And you, you see demonic activity just start screaming once John started preaching. Then when Jesus, you know, uh, formally stepped into his earthly ministry, also massive in intensification. And Jesus said in the Amplified, I don't know if you've seen it in the Amplified, he said that that kingdom violence, if you want in the kingdom, you got to be violent. And that violent means in the Greek, uh, intense devotion, ardent zeal. And Jesus said, if you're not violent, you're not getting in. Not since John opened his mouth. So people who are, you know, passive, people who are tepid, people who are half-hearted, they think that they're part of Christ's kingdom. No, you're not. If the Holy Spirit moves into your uh, into your life, then you're not going to be passive. You're not going to stay that way. You might be. You're not going to be, you know, half-hearted. You're not going to be lollygagging, you know, in regards to your relationship with Christ and, and his word in the world. And uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, disavow anybody right now of any kind of delusion that you're right with God when you carry on like that, because you're not. And Christ said that if if you're not hot, you know, then and you're not uh, cold, says you're lukewarm and you make me sick and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And again, you know, Ken, and I sound like, you know, the Grim Reaper and I'm making Van Gogh look like a rodeo clown right now. Um, people think, well, that's negative. I, I know it's negative. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that I don't like, but it's, sure. but it's there. And we're morons if we, you know, hop, skip and jump over those offensive aspects of the scripture. I had this uh, homosexual guy tell me the other day when I was preaching on uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, he said that that scripture that called him out for his yes. sin offended him. And uh, I said, you think that as a sinner, now I don't do what you do, okay? I've been drunk and high in my life before I got saved, and I've never wanted to kiss a man. So I don't have, I don't have your sin, uh, amigo, but I got plenty of other sins that that verse also uh, condemns as an abomination, and that if I don't stop the practice thereof, then I'm going to Dante's easy bake. And so a lot of people and a lot of pastors, I was talking to this guy the other day, man, and a very powerful uh, person. And Ken, he said that his church literally had a meeting to avoid talking about sin, judgment, holiness, the wrath of God, the reality of an eternal hell, and uh, they they literally got their little tinker pot, you know, elder board and their little pastors or whatever the heck these hirelings are calling themselves now. And they talked about how they could dance around all those incredible issues. And uh, brother, that's some that's some scary C.R.A.P. to me. I would not I would leave if I was an elder. I'd resign mm -hmm. right there if I was part if I was an associate pastor. And those words came out of that dipstick lead pastor's mouth. I would like, I'm out. It's just like a cop uh, that's been told to arrest a Christian for not wearing a face mask. I'm not a cop anymore. I'm not going to play that kind of stupid game. Sure. You know, and how people can continue on like that. Brother, that's that's scary. And I think God has appointed uh, some of these places are going to hear a message that I'm saying, and it's going to hit them like a, a Chinese throwing star uh, flung by Jackie Chan right in the forehead and they're going to repent. Other people are going to double down on stupid and political correctness and wokeness and trying to be hip and groovy. And uh, I think then they morph from being, you know, somebody who's okay. You're not, you're, you're not that bad. You're not that good. Now you're a false prophet. And now you're a deluding spirit. Mm -hmm. And now you're tickling people's ear and you move into mm -hmm. something that is demonic and something that has uh, a laser tag, you know, on the forehead where God's going to mark them out uh, for his wrath. And, um, and again, I don't say that that stuff lightly because like I said, at the outset, this is serious business. Yeah. John definitely had a message of repentance you know, and uh, they saw an authenticity in him that they didn't see in all the religious people, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. I mean, you know, you had 
tax collectors, you had the soldiers, you know, and they're saying, what can we do? You know, I think there is some people, there are people out there that, you know, they're just not hearing the message from the pulpits, you know, repent, turn, you know, turn from your sin. And, uh, yeah, like you say, I think it's going to be a, a rough day for them at the judgment seat. Yeah. And that's, uh, uh, again, we've got to, you know, live ever mindful of that. Um, Paul did. Yeah. You see in second Corinthians five, he didn't say, because I love sinners so much, um, you know, that's why I preached the gospel. He said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, mm-hmm. we persuade men to turn to Christ. And people don't people don't even uh, realize that when we're saved, it's like, oh, we're saved from our sin or we're saved from Satan. And it's like, no, you're saved from God. He's your worst enemy. You're saved from his wrath. Yeah. That's what happened. When Christ was uh, became the propitiation of payment for your sin, mm-hmm then you were freed from the wrath of almighty God. And again, you know, it's, uh, that's where John the Baptist comes in. And you know, here's, before we end, um, I got to bring up the whole aspect of Jesus was like John. Yeah. He was, I mean, people think that, well, there's rough, you know, John who's cuddly, you know, like a cactus. And then there's sweet Jesus, you know, walking around, you know, telling aphorisms like an over-medicated Joel Osteen on a three-day Mountain Dew bender. And uh, and so Jesus is the nice guy. John is the rough guy. We want Jesus. Goodbye, John. And um, when Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16 what the scuttlebutt on the street is in regards to who do people say that I am, they said Elijah, Jeremiah, or John the Baptist. And so that, you know, again, I wrote a book called If Masculinity is Toxic called Jesus Radioactive. And I show the overt masculine traits of Christ. These guys were, <laughs> they, they were not the little dainty, you know, uh, people that, you know, artists have depicted them. These guys were, these guys were blue collar, tough, uh, working class people. Uh, there's, I've been a fisherman all my life, all over the world. And uh, fishermen aren't these, you know, little bearded women walking around in beige pinois and Birkenstocks. They were, they were hardy, rough, cussing dudes like the deadliest catch. And uh, and Christ had that kind of masculinity that appealed to those guys, or they would have never followed him. Yeah. No, but fishermen aren't sitting out there on the dock waiting for some penciled neck, you know, spiritual guru to lead them by the hand and make sense of life, you know. But they will uh, follow a, a holy revolutionary, and that's what Christ was in his buddy John. I just hope, Ken, that uh, when I spring off this mortal coil, that there is video that I can watch to compare how John the Baptist preached and, and compare him how, you know, uh, these uh, these hipster, skinny jean, tinkerpot pastors preach, because I bet it's way different, man. No doubt. Uh, let's talk about you it, as you kind of close to the book there, the benefits of a rude awakening. We're, we're pretty much in agreement that, you know, things need to change. Yeah. Yeah. The benefits are, is uh, you get healing, you know, it's like it says in Hosea six, uh, I think it's one through three. So that God wounds, wounds us, but he heals us. And you see like in second Corinthians seven, when Paul describes, uh, what true repentance is and, uh, Paul said, I, uh, he said, uh, hey, church in Corinth, I caused you grief by my letter. He said, but uh, I'm not sorry, because this grief that, you know, through the rebuke of Paul to the, the, the crazy church in Corinth, it made them all sorrowful, made them feel bad. But he said that that sorrow led to repentance and that godly sorrow brought uh, the fear of God back into their life. It brought the zeal of God. It brought the avenging of any kind of wrongdoing that they did. It it brought them back, you know, in good stead, uh, you know, with the Father and with each other. And the Holy Spirit came back to the church instead of, you know, leaving it when they were uh, when they were allowing for, you know, some very tawdry stuff to go down in that uh, ecclesia. And um, so so that was rude. It was sorrowful, but then it's fruitful. It's just like, you know, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, it's like, hey, don't faint when you start getting uh, discipline. Because if you don't faint, uh, you're going to have this peaceful fruit of righteousness. You're going to be more and more like Christ. And so a lot of people think, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is not fun. Don't talk about it. 
listen, discipline is the way of life. It's the way of greatness. It's the way of true destiny and purpose. You want to bring in those terms. But more importantly, it is the that is the way our flesh gets corralled and gets conformed into the image of the sun. And it's not it's not fun. I mean, fainting. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. When God starts whooping your backside, don't pass out. And nobody talks about that, man. Nobody. Mm -hmm. That it can be so intense upon the person's life that you want to pass out. And the writer of Hebrews says, don't do it because there's fruit coming. Mm -hmm. I, I like what you said in there with the uh, revelations three twenty. I believe it is that, you know, Oh, the way we present this is it's not a repentance turn message. It's so, oh, you know, Oh Jesus, you know, he's outside the door. He's catching a cold. Let him in. <laughs> yeah. You better let him in. What uh, He's going to catch pneumonia. If you don't let him in, he's not going to make it. You know, it's just, uh, almost a sissified version of Christ rather than the message that they, uh, John the Baptist and Jesus actually preached. Well, Paul said uh, there are false Christs out there, and um, somebody preaches a Jesus that we haven't preached that's not according to the apostles' doctrine. Don't buy it, not for a second, because they're there, you know. And uh, Paul told Timothy, he's like, don't become part of that uh, ear-tickling crowd. Preach the word, rebuke, reprove, and exhort with great patience. Yeah, another passage I think I'd like for you to talk about is, I don't think this is one that's talked about a lot either. It's, it's the wild bull anointing in Psalms 92, 10. Bro, one of my favorite things to do, Ken, is to go to places and passages that no Christian would touch with a 10-foot pew. And, uh, you know, it's like, first of, first of all, when people talk about, you know, the Holy Spirit, it's like, oh, he's just gentle like a dove. I, I'm like, I've hunted dove. All my life, have you ever seen doves fight? That ain't gentle. You ever seen yeah. a couple of doves uh, scrap? That's 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 incredible. And um, so when we think of the Holy Spirit, you know, falling on people, it's you know we get like weird looks in our eyes, and we get this kind of airy fairy type, uh, I don't know, thing coming off of us where we're uber spiritual now. Uh, David said when he was anointed with fresh oil in Psalm 92, verse 10, which is always a uh, type and shadow of the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon or inside of a person, says that God turned him into a wild ox or a wild bull. And um, I, I think it's, he said, he, he God had exalted his horn like that of a wild bull. And I think, you know, that's, that's very uh, interesting because um, uh, I've hunted uh, the wild bovine and all over this this uh, terra firma multiple trips in africa and several places uh, around the united states on the big game farms that they allow for hunting those big bovines and uh they're scary man they are scary you know especially cape buffalo because they're pursued by lions and they look at you like you owe them money and david said that when the spirit came in him and god blessed him god turned him into a bull in a china shop and uh Again, you know, like you did uh, introducing this question to me, nobody talks about that. And everybody's like, well, God wants us to be mild. It's like, no, God wants you to be wild. God wants you to be dangerous. God wants you to be somebody who's not safety first. God wants you to be uh, something uh, more akin to a wild bull instead of a, a gelded, you know, uh, castrated bull. And that's what most pastors are. They're, they're emasculated, castrated, gelded, you know, not productive. But if you are, if you are uh, um, fortunate like David, God makes you into a, a wild cattle. And um, again, that's why I paint a lot of my paintings with, with wild uh, uh, buffalo and wild cape buffalo from Africa and wild bison and stuff, because to me, Life imitates art, and that stuff rubs off on you, man. And 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 if people think I'm nuts in regards to this wild buffalo anointing, you know who else was called a wild buffalo in the scripture? Dear listener, it was God. In Numbers 23 and in Numbers 24, when Balaam's trying to curse the people of God, uh, he said that God brought Israel out of Egypt like a wild ox. And so there, there you go. You know, it's like, do you want God to bless you? And I don't even know what it means, Ken, but I know that it has diddly squat to do with, 
you know, being Mr. Rogers or being the nice guy and being scared of saying the truth and being scared of this and that and being afraid and timid and curling up in the fetal position and wet my diaper. I, I think it's a, it's a release into boldness. It's a anointing of fearlessness. And so I can't think of anything more necessary right now for the pastors and for the Christian is to get a whole big old 1000 CC mega dose of boldness and courage. Hmm. Yeah. I, I know you talk about first Corinthians chapter six, nine and 10 about the effeminization that's happening with the culture and with the church. And uh, let me speak on that for a minute. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people think, Hey, you're full of too much bravado. No, this is, this is something that the Holy spirit has done in me. He's convinced me through the, the scripture. Uh, I'm not supposed to be some effeminate tinker pot that is, that is, you know, a softy. Uh, if I, when I, when I show uh, soft sides of Doug, it's always from a, a point of danger and it's always from a point of strength. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. It's like uh, uh, the lion in uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan's like, is he safe? No, oh, he's dangerous. Uh, but I can't remember how they phrased it. But he's a good, yeah. So yes. he's, not, he's not safe. He's good, but he's very dangerous, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, the the word effeminate in the Greek is a Greek word malakos. It means to be malleable. It means to be soft. It means to be delicate. It means uh, uh, to be mild and basically some kind of Gumby like pushover that people and demons can bend and twist, and that kind of person will you know roll with that kind of demonic flow. And uh, God's never called us to be that kind of stuff, not at all. And he makes a differentiation uh, between homosexuality and effeminacy. You can be a homosexual and not be effeminate. You can be effeminate and not be a homosexual. And that that uh, that sin of being a softy, you know, and it's like, well, it's just his personality. Well, guess what? You get to crucify your personality. I have to crucify my personality. I'm an obnoxious jackass, Ken. And uh, God's always reigning me in. And if somebody's just a soft little, you know, dainty, dainty person that, you know, avoids confrontation, that avoids, uh, you know, standing up when uh, somebody needs to stand up, then you'll feel conviction because that's not how God hardwired anybody. And you can't use this, you know, that's not my personality trait. I think you saw a lot of that happening during COVID and, as you mentioned, some of these other things that, uh, you know, you can drive around churches and these pastors have bent the knee, you know, you have a, a, a rainbow flag cross or, you know, a, a BLM uh, banner and they're apologizing because they're white. And... Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's sad, you know, especially after, I mean, the COVID stuff, you know, it's like, ah, we got to shut our church down. You know, Mayor McCheese told us, that uh, we can't uh, continue. It's like, show me one place in the Bible where Jesus said, hey, listen, if a bad cold's going around, uh, I want you guys to stop communion. Don't hug each other. Don't greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, don't sing together. Don't high five. Don't hug. Don't do any of that stuff until Caesar allows us, you know, once again to congregate. They wouldn't do it. Right. And we see examples, multiple examples in the book of Acts when Peter was told, oh, you got to stop doing that. He's like, you know what? Uh, no, thank you. But no. And uh, we must obey God rather than men. And um, but there again, you have these little puppets. I've, I've seen memos, uh, Ken, from from uh, big churches. Uh, that they're so smarmy and they think everything that they do is just wonderful and glorious where they said, and I quote, we will follow the edicts of the governor and he will tell us when we can come together peacefully and wisely once again. And I'm like, wow, you do have a governor and his name is Jesus Christ. He's king of kings. He's king of that lesser civil magistrate. And also when people bring up, well, we got to obey government according to Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. Yeah, when government praises evil, and punishes good but when they punish good and praise evil and that's uh good and evil defined by the scripture and not netflix then we're duty bound as lesser magistrates to disobey our reigning civil magistrates 
And if people don't get that, they don't get anything about the scripture whatsoever. And that's the reason why Paul and Peter and all the other disciples bounced in and out of jail their entire life, because they wouldn't obey Caesar when Caesar tried to shut them up. Yeah, so many of them, they not only shut their churches, they were proud to do it. They yeah, love, yeah, Mike Pence said it's loving your neighbor. I don't care what Mike Pence says. And again, that's why it, you go back to it's it's got to be a holy dread. Your call has to be from on high, because if not, you're going to put on butt kisser lip balm and go smack every government official's uh, backside when they tell you to jump, you know. And, uh, and because most pastors worship and idolize their 501c3, which the church never had, you know, in, in pretty much in the, the entirety of its existence until just a few decades ago, then they decided, you know, they're going to be the wuss and they're not going to talk about anything political. Meanwhile, on the left, uh, that's all they do in their churches. For sure. Well, let's talk a minute about your art, if you have a minute. Yeah, you bet. You really hit the nail on the head when you talk about some of these old paintings that you see in these huge Bibles that they, the characters that they paint are almost effeminate. Yeah, they, they, they're right there. <laughs> they're right there on the effeminacy uh, border, that's for sure, if they're not full on effeminate. Yeah, so um, uh, I've been an artist and an a oil painter for many, many moons and, and my stuff uh sells all over the world. Don Jr. has got uh, a painting, R.C. Sproul, who's who's passed away. He he bought a painting uh, from me. Dr. D. James Kennedy also uh, has my painting of John Knox, which is still in Knox Theological Seminary. And uh, we've got uh, Colonel Alan West has a painting that I did of uh, Mel Gibson's character in The Patriot when he took his tomahawk and he split the skull of the red coat who had his son, Heath Ledger was playing, uh, held captive. And uh, a lot of people, uh, lesser luminaries and stuff, if you will, uh, have purchased them. Um, one of the things that that I, I love about the, the artwork that I do is that it messes with people. It 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 upsets them, and not so much in a, it offends them, but it 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 rankles them. So when like I'm looking right now at a painting that I did of the the twelve disciples, and uh, they don't look like the disciples that you know, you're bringing up about like that, you know, Da Vinci painted or uh, any of the Raphaelite artists and any of the, even the Renaissance, you know, masters and stuff, because they all painted them to look like bearded women. They look, I mean, if you, I, I dare people, if they're like, oh, Doug's full of crap on this. Like, no, go to Google, type in Leonardo Da Vinci and John the Baptist and you're going to see an image that this, you know, master painted of John the Baptist that looks like Kate Hudson when she starred in the movie Almost Famous. And uh, I tried to figure out, it's like, why is why are all the why are all the disciples and Jesus himself? Why are all these guys bearded women? Why are they effeminate? Why why is what's going on here? And then I started putting it together. It's like, well, you got a lame pope that's commissioning. Uh, effeminate artists who are hiring effeminate models to project to the masses who can't read, but they get all their gospel from the artwork in the cathedrals, an effeminate Christ, and then poof, ipso facto, man, it turns into an effeminate congregation. Because guys who are guys, they look at that kind of stuff, and they said, well, that's interesting, and then they walk out the door. And uh, that's why I think uh, uh, rugged art, um, uh, masculine art, masculine imagery, uh, painting apex predators. Uh, I've got a picture of David holding Goliath's head up. And I had this Christian say to me, uh, <laughs> Ken, his, his, his kid was named David. And, uh, and I handed him this beautiful Gicle on canvas uh, print. So this is for your boy. And he goes, oh, I'm not going to put that in my son's room. I was like, why not? He said, it's just too violent. And I don't want him to grow up, you know, being a violent person. And I go, well, throw the Bible away because the Bible is filled with that, uh, that imagery and that literary device. The Bible is very violent. And your kid's going to face monsters one of these days. And he needs to have in his worrying tin brain that God will give him power 
over that which opposes that which is holy, just, and good. And that's what King David as a teenager represents. So I don't get it, man. But um, uh, I tell people all the time, if life imitates art, then don't get lame art. And uh, I've got several collections of, of portraits that I've done, done a lot of Western type art. Also, I've got my biblical badass collection with some, some great pieces in there of John the Baptist, done five or six of those. And uh, my Trump collection's uh, hilarious, and and, and uh, it's it's always a favorite item for uh, the God and country loving patron. Yeah, I think your art. When I came across your art, I, th I really think it it captures the essence and the spirit of the men and women of God that you're painting. And it was just really illuminating when I saw that. I in fact ordered a piece of art from you uh, Sunday, but. Yeah, I, I I really love that, and uh, it's it's realistic, you know. I mean, David took his head off. You know, what are you going to do with that? Right? How do you gussy that up? Yeah, you know? yeah. But again, you know, just for for a father to say that, and this is a good dude, you know, and it's like, yeah, I just don't want him to grow up like that. It's like, don't you should want him to grow up like? Yes, C.S. Lewis had some type of a quote, and you help me if I get this. But he said, yeah, you know, uh, my kids are going to, the kids are going to grow up and there's going to be evil, mean people out there. So read them stories about heroes, about knights, about conquerors who yep. overcame the evil in the world. You yep. know, let them have that uh, imagery and that, uh, you know, knowledge of that. Right on. My grandkids, uh, uh, eight, oldest son, uh, oldest grandson he's eight uh granddaughter's five and uh then we've got uh the third one who's two and we've watched braveheart with them we've yeah. watched master and commander everybody's like oh, it's you know that's too early it's like no it's not that's the thing they're the clay in their noggin is very wet that's what you know me and uh you know my daughter and son-in-law that's what we want imprinted on their head not this crap that's coming out of uh disney and all this other stuff where they're filling them with filth and transgenderism yeah. and all kind of bizarreness. And they've got the guys, if there is a guy in the film, that he's always some dunderheaded weakling. And um, they are they sit fascinated, Ken, when they watch that stuff. They're not like, oh, you know, and they're not hiding their you know eyes. It's just and you could tell it's imprinting upon them that, you know, there there are things uh, worth fighting for. There are things worth dying for and freedom is one of those things. And, uh, and so boom, you know, thanks to Mel Gibson and who would have thought, you know, that, you know, we need a great movie about freedom and Liberty. And we need a, also an incredible movie about Christ and his passion and his work. What Christian prophet out there said, you know, the Lord's telling me that in 1999 or whatever, there's going to be this, this anti-Semitic chain smoking drunkard, who's going to do the greatest film about Jesus Christ heretofore. I don't remember any prophet ever prophesying that, Ken, by the way. Yeah, I think God uses people, uh, John the Baptist, like you say in your book, nobody. I'm talking about nobody would have uh, picked him to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't allow him. Not only would they not pick him for, you know, to be the MC of the main event in human history, they wouldn't let him take up an offering at your typical church the way he's dressed. Probably wouldn't let him, you know, come to the covered dish dinner because when everybody else is bringing casseroles and and stuff, he brings he brings a a live bait well full of crickets, you know. And and again, that's to me that is one of the most refreshing aspects of uh, you know the deep dive into John the Baptist's work is to understand that God chooses foolish things to shame the wise. And uh, he had this this kid in isolation for years, making him, preparing him for a short, you know, three, four year ministry and poof, head cut off and gone. And most pastors nowadays, they prepare three years for a milk toast 30 year ministry that doesn't do a fraction of what John the Baptist did. So there's a lot of deep things, man, in there that that I think, you know, kind of get uh, pushed down or ignored because of just the gruff aspect of John's messaging stuff. The making of John, to me, that's fascinating. And uh, mm -hmm. there's not 
there's not hardly anything, you know, that said his, his birth and then boom, nothing uh, for 30 years. He's just in the wilderness uh, going to the University of Earth, Wind and Fire and having God make him and hardwire him to, again, you know, shake all of hell and introduce his son, which is no easy task. I don't care who you are. You need divine power to pull that job off. Yeah, it seems like God took all of his great people uh, into the desert, into the wilderness, had some type of experience. Yeah, that's where God brings you to your zero point, you know. I had this uh, minister who's uh, pretty frustrated in his life right now. He he told me, he's like, man, I've been in the wilderness for 20 years. I go, well, the, the upshot is, is that's where God, you know, pulled the majority of all of his leaders from. And, uh, but I would still say, if you're going to have a John the Baptist type impact, you know, just go ahead and uh, become more and more patient because you could be there 10 or 20 more years longer. And we don't want to hear that, Ken. No, no pastor wants to hear that. It's like, I want instant likes. I want instant growth. I want instant this. And I tell them all the time, the only thing in the scripture that grew up overnight, withered overnight, and that was the vine that protected Jonah's head. If God's going to do something through you, he's going to stretch you like a bungee cord with Rosie O'Donnell on the other end of it, jumping off a bridge. And that's just the way it is, you know, yeah. and it torments me. Leonard Ravenhill told me, he told me one time when I was a young squab, he said, it's going to take you 20 years, Doug, before you become a man of God. And uh, I hated that. And, uh, but Ravenhill was wrong. It took me 30. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God's ways are definitely not our ways. And, you know, when you look at uh, what Jesus said about John the Baptist, there's none greater born among women yeah what an accolade man i'm that telling means, you that means abraham isaac jacob moses david elijah elisha jeremiah all the prophets major and minor everybody and uh, and and his mother mary by the way uh mm -hmm. nobody was greater than john and uh, to that point and then he says you know uh those who are now in the kingdom you're greater than john but up to that point, in regards to the Old Testament people, boom, he's the greatest one that ever walked this terra firma. And again, we wouldn't call him great. We'd call him weird. We'd make fun of his haircut. We'd make fun of his clothes. It's like, oh, how big's your church? Oh, you don't have a church? Oh, you're just preaching in a creek? Woohoo! You know, we'd think he's a full-on uh, loser and, uh, again, just some idiosyncratic weirdo. And um, Jesus said, no, he's the greatest prophet uh here to four yeah absolutely well doug i appreciate your time tell us uh how can people get in contact with you to view your art or some of your i know you have a podcast uh, what uh what are some some ways they can reach out to you and, and get more information yeah so my main stomping ground is uh doug giles that's g-i-l-e-s dot org so they can find the art the podcasts uh all my books and all the links to everything else uh i do on social media and stuff so dougjiles.org ken all right well i appreciate your time you bet buddy stay rowdy brother